Pilot Handbook 1-2 Introduction to Flying Let's focus on safety measures. Imagine beacon towers standing at intervals of approximately 10 miles along the airways. These towers, 51 feet high, were topped with a powerful rotating light. Below this light, two course lights pointed forward and back, flashing a code to identify the beacon's number. The towers usually stood in the center of a concrete arrow 70 feet long, with a generator shed at the feather end. Shift gears to federal certification of pilots and mechanics. In April 1927, the aeronautics branch issued its first pilot license to William P. Mack Kraken Jr., who was also the chief of the aeronautics branch. Just three months later, the aeronautics branch issued the first federal aircraft mechanic license. Safety concerns also led to the establishment of a system for certifying aircraft. On March 29, 1927, the aeronautics branch issued the first airworthiness type certificate to the Boole Airster California 3. By 1934, recognizing the strides made in aviation, the aeronautics branch was renamed the Bureau of Air Commerce. Now, let's fast forward to 1936. The Bureau of Air Commerce played a significant role in bringing together airlines and encouraging the formation of the first three air traffic control, ATC, facilities along established air routes. These facilities marked a significant advancement in air traffic management, replacing the early methods of controllers using maps and chalkboards. From historic beacon towers to the evolution of air traffic control, this journey captures the transformative moments that shaped aviation safety and regulation in the United States. Now, let's navigate through the transformative years in aviation, starting with the Civil Aeronautics Act of 1938. Imagine a time when civil aviation responsibilities shifted to a newly formed independent entity, the Civil Aeronautics Authority, CAA. Picture President Franklin Roosevelt splitting the CAA into two agencies, the Civil Aeronautics Administration, CAA, and the Civil Aeronautics Board, CAB. Both were part of the Department of Commerce, but the CAB operated independently. Fast forward to 1946 when Congress entrusted the CAA with administering the Federal Aid Airport Program, a move aimed at promoting civil airports nationwide. The aviation landscape continued to evolve, setting the stage for the Federal Aviation Act of 1958. As air traffic soared, and jet aircraft entered the scene, the need for more regulation became evident. The Act established the Federal Aviation Agency, absorbing the roles of the CAA and the rule-making authority of the CAB. Picture General Elwood Richard, Pete, Quesada becoming the first administrator of the Federal Aviation Administration in 1959. Now, zoom in on October 15, 1966, when Congress created the Department of Transportation, DOT, bringing oversight of the transportation industry under one umbrella. This marked a pivotal moment as both air and surface transportation came under the DOT's purview. Picture the Federal Aviation Administration evolving within this framework, as it began operating under the DOT on April 1, 1967. As aviation grew, the National Transportation Safety Board or NTSB took on the role of the CAB, focusing on the investigation of transportation accidents. As the Federal Aviation Administration's responsibilities expanded, it assumed duties related to aviation security during the hijacking epidemic of the 1960s. After the events of September 11, 2001, these duties shifted to the newly created Department of Homeland Security, DHS. Visualize the Federal Aviation Administration's focus on environmental aspects, regulating noise standards for aircraft, and overseeing high-altitude kite and balloon flying. In 1970, the Federal Aviation Administration's responsibilities grew further with the addition of a Federal Airport Aid Program and increased oversight of airport safety. Moving to the mid-1970s, envision the Federal Aviation Administration achieving a semi-automated air traffic control or ATC system, blending radar and computer technology. This system allowed controllers to concentrate on critical tasks, but with the surge in air traffic due to the Airline Deregulation Act of 1978, the Federal Aviation Administration needed to keep pace. The National Airspace System or NAS plan emerged in 1982, outlining advanced systems for en route and terminal ATC, modernized flight service stations, and improvements in ground-to-air surveillance and communication. As we delve into the history of civil aviation in the United States, a significant chapter unfolds, the Professional Air Traffic Controllers Organization, PATCO, strike. Picture this. While the Federal Aviation Administration was in the midst of preparing the National Airspace System, NAS, plan, tensions between the management and PATCO, the Air Traffic Controllers Organization, came to a head. 
In 1970, there was a sick out by 3,000 controllers, leading to improvements in wages and retirement benefits. However, another period of discord culminated in an illegal strike in August 1981. The government responded by dismissing over 11,000 striking controllers and decertifying PATCO. By spring 1984, the Federal Aviation Administration lifted the last special restrictions imposed during the strike to maintain the safe operation of the airspace system. Now, shift your focus to the Airline Deregulation Act of 1978, a transformative piece of legislation that reshaped the landscape of commercial aviation. Up until 1978, the Civil Aeronautics Board, CAB, played a pivotal role in regulating fares, routes, and schedules. The Airline Deregulation Act, however, dismantled many of these controls, paving the way for a new era in passenger air travel marked by unfettered competition. Here's the backdrop. The CAB, with functions ranging from awarding routes to limiting entry into new markets and regulating passenger fares, had shaped commercial passenger travel for decades. The roots of these practices could be traced back to the policies of Walter Folger Brown, the U.S. Postmaster General during President Herbert Hoover's administration. Brown's influence was instrumental in the creation of major domestic airlines like United, American, Eastern, and Transcontinental and Western Air, TWA, along with granting Pan American a monopoly on international routes. The momentum for deregulation gained traction during President Jimmy Carter's tenure. He appointed economist Alfred Kahn, a staunch advocate of deregulation, to lead the cab. Simultaneously, external forces, such as the emergence of Freddie Laker's Skytrain service offering cheap transatlantic flights, and the cab easing limitations on charter flights, added fuel to the push for deregulation. Despite resistance from major airlines, labor unions, and safety advocates, Congress formally deregulated air cargo in November 1977. The decisive moment arrived in late 1978 with the passage of the Airline Deregulation Act, primarily authored by Senators Edward Kennedy and Howard Cannon. Despite opposition, the act garnered public support by offering subsidies to major airlines and high unemployment benefits to workers who might lose their jobs due to deregulation. The act, gradually phased in, had a profound impact on the passenger market. For the first time in 40 years, airlines gained the freedom to enter or expand routes as they saw fit. Starting in 1982, they also had complete freedom to set their fares. The culmination of this shift occurred in 1984, with the abolition of the cab, as its regulatory role was no longer deemed necessary. This period marked a turning point, ushering in a new era of competition and innovation in the aviation industry.